Bloomingdale resident since 2016. <laughs> <laughs> since uh, my wife and I moved here in 2016, uh, we just had a daughter two months ago. Uh, so if anything is drastically wrong or in this presentation, just pipe up. <laughs> <laughs> There's limited sleep on everyone's part here. But she, she's good about like sleeping for like stretches.
So you could you could do all this, and there was a huge amount of commerce that sprung up everywhere throughout the interior of New York, places that had been really isolated and rural prior to that. Um, and in addition to being the mother of cities, the the Erie Canal ended up being the mother of American civil engineering. Um, there really wasn't American civil engineering prior to the Erie Canal. There were no schools of civil engineering in North America. If you wanted to be a civil engineer or an engineer, they, they called them civil engineers. They just called them engineers. If you wanted to be an engineer and actually were credited properly study that engineer, you had to go to Europe uh, because the, the kingdoms of Europe had done a whole lot of work in like rationalizing their empires that they needed. They needed to have systems to, to manage these sprawling colonial states. So uh, the, the states of Europe, France in particular, had the best and really the only schools for civil engineering. Nobody in, in America, well, they didn't know what they were doing, but they weren't, there weren't proper schools for it, right? There weren't systems for teaching people this. And the Erie Canal is really where it started. The Erie Canal was the first school of engineering. Huge numbers of engineers who had really never worked on any serious, what do you think the serious project? Whose really, who's only experience was surveying, uh, found themselves responsible for cutting shipping blocks into limestone cliffs and that sort of thing. You know, there was a huge amount of responsibility foisted upon young men exclusively men at this time, of course, um, who really shouldn't have had any capabilities to handle it, right? Like they really shouldn't have been able to do this, but they did in a lot of cases with great aplomb. The guy I pictured there. Uh, is a man named Canvas White picture because he has such an incredible name. Canvas White. They just don't make names like that anymore. Um, <laughs> but uh, he is the inventor of American mint concrete. Uh, before he came along, we didn't know how to make concrete in the United States. All the recipes for making concrete were based on European limestone. So you had to ship European limestone from Europe to the Americas and make the concrete. That was obviously hugely expensive and laborious, especially if you're going to build 300 miles of canal. So they, we needed a solution. Canvas White figured it out. He went to Europe. He studied at the, he studied at the French engineering school, and then came back and used the principles that he had learned of concrete mixing in Europe to learn how to make concrete <coughs> in American limestone for the very first time. And that was really what enabled it. It was really difficult to imagine the Erie Canal. Uh, making it as a project without the advent of, those, of, that, of that concrete. So, Canvas White, they got they got some man. And after this, the men who taught themselves how to be civil engineers in the Erie Canal founded the first proper American schools of, of engineering. And at that point, the most prominent school, a place where all the best uh, teachers and students went, was the West Point Military. And the, the Army Corps of Engineers largely ran West Point and, and sort of dominated the place in, in construction there for decades and decades. You know, the West Point guys were, were engineers, first and foremost, for many, many years. Um, and as the age of civil engineering goes forward, right, the Erie Canal is an incredible inspiration. There's canals and dams and waterworks that, that jump up all over the country because suddenly you can goods way faster, way cheaper. Um, uh, and so this leads to a whole bunch of sort of speculation, a whole bunch of private enterprises building a whole bunch of stuff that they don't necessarily take care of very well. So this kind of came to a head in 1889 in western Pennsylvania, a place called Johnstown. Uh, the Carnegies and their rich friends had a, had a, a country club stay with a lake that they liked to fish in. And that lake was created by a dam, the dam. And they didn't really take care of the dam. They didn't take care of the drainage outlets for the dam. And so one day when there was a huge storm, a historic rainstorm, the lake was suddenly flooded. The lake was building up and water was building up behind the dam faster than they could let it out. Debris clogged the outlets. They didn't have any capacity to let them go. And it became clear to the engineers pretty quickly there that uh, run the engineers, the caretakers of the dam, that it wasn't going to work. Um, there wasn't really any opportunity to get any kind of warning to people down on the stream, so the end result was a, uh, a wall of water 40 to 60 feet high. Um, 
the thing that you find out when you research these floods is we don't really get like these sort of biblical cataclysmic events uh, anymore. They're not really part of our, our consciousness in, in the 21st century. Um, a flood of that scale doesn't operate as a liquid. It's really a solid. It, it picks up everything that it touches and rolls it together in a giant ball. So um, that huge hill rolling over and over had trees, it had houses, it had thousands of dead livestock, it had the, con it had the contents of a barbed wire factory. <laughs> <laughs> picked up several hundred miles of barbed wire and, uh, oh. and, and just shredded everything, right? Um, just total devastation. Uh, no, no chance for really anybody to escape except I felt like um, one of, the, one of the, the worst disasters in American history. And so to give you an idea of the scale of water change, the, the river that, gets, that got flooded in Johnstown, it's called the Little Covenant Mob. It's a cute little name. It's like a little stony brook. It, it had to be, uh, the water level had to be pushed up by dams to like, to be able to move boats. There's a little thing. And for about an hour, uh, it carried the volume of the Mississippi. Uh, yeah, so after this disaster, that really changed how people thought about dams and civil infrastructure. Uh, it was like not, it wasn't something that was just sort of there in school. It was something that, pres that, ever, that presented a constant and potential lethal hazard to everybody in the people, to entire towns, thousands of people who could die. And so it became clear uh, by, the, by the turn of the, of the 20th century that the only entities that were really, that had the like, power and authority and responsibility necessary to build and maintain these structures were governments, were states, were the federal government. Private entities could be involved in, in, in building small dams or building the dams themselves. The dams were almost exclusively going forward would be owned and operated by governments because governments were the only entity to get with the who could handle that kind of liability, the thousands of lives of the right? Yeah. So um, that was a huge, that was a huge change factor. And then uh, but it, when once that happened, and once the capacities are sort of growing and modernizing government got plugged into the civil infrastructure system. We got some really amazing things built in this country. This is the Wilson Dam, the Tennessee, um, Tennessee River in, in Alabama. Confusingly in Alabama, but the Tennessee River. Uh, this is at a place called Muscle Shoals that uh, is, forms the hub of, of the Tennessee Valley Authority system. The Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, first commissioned by uh, by FDR uh, within months of his inauguration. Um, it was a huge priority for him for Senator George Morris from Nebraska. Um, that system was built around this dam at Muscle Shoal. With this dam, they knew that they could build a whole bunch of other things. So this dam became the dam that powered a pair of uh, fertilizer <coughs> plants. And those fertilizer plants supply fertilizer to also impacted water that enabled the distribution of water for agriculture. The dam also raised uh, raised water levels above the dam, enabling uh, navigation through sections of the Tennessee River that had never in the history of America been safe and navigable. Muscle Shoals was named because that area was the site of a terrible rip current that would just destroy any boat that went through it. Muscle Shoals, right? Uh, also, it might also be there's actually a dispute as to why it's called muscle shoals. It's either the terrible power of the red current or the proliferation of freshwater mussels in the area. So it's really like hard one way or the other. It's nicer mean. That's a big um, But in any case, huge portions of the Tennessee River have never been, even into the 20th century, had never been navigable by barges and commercial freight until these systems came into place. So the TVA uh, really served as a sort of comprehensive model for the government operating as an enterprise, as a business, uh, and, and thinking of itself in that way, thinking of itself as a driver of economic development in a way, in a direct way that had been sort of uh, discouraged before that. Um, you know, the, the, the Republican <coughs> administration in the, in the very early 20th century, they were not, they were not into infrastructure. 
just wasn't it just wasn't a priority we see in some cases to do. So Roosevelt inaugurated well, he, this project had been going on underway for a little bit, but Roosevelt really inaugurated from like 19, 1930 to 1970 is really like the golden age of American. During that time, we built about, it's hard to tell it's a lot of dams, but we built, a, there, we built at least 50,000 dams wow. during 40 years. Right now, in this country, right now today, there are 90,000 dams. 50,000 of them are considered major dams, which by the federal government's accounting is 50 feet or higher. 50,000 of them. An incredible. The, the sheer amount of concrete, right? You could build a right? you could build a bridge to the move of it. Uh, the, the taken collectively as a project, and I think that is it. Like I think that is the correct way to think about it. Even though these dams got built over decades and decades of, on various rivers and, and all of that, taken collectively as a project, you're looking at the biggest, most comprehensive, most expensive civil engineering project in the history. That's what it is. It, the dams that we've built have no parallel uh, in human history in terms of the scale and the number of them. Um, so, and we did this, it's important to realize like while fighting World War II, while rebuilding you know, from that, while fighting the Korean War, while doing the entire Cold War, while going to the moon, while establishing Social Security and Medicare and, and all these other things, everything that happened in the 20th century happened while this incredible, like, this incredible domestic spending binge was going on. Not to mention the interstate highways. Not, thank you, I forgot that. Not to mention the interstate highways that just happened like, literally simultaneously with this 40 year buildup, right? It was this incredible amount of money and resources, just a staggering amount of stuff that got pumped into this country in terms of building it up, building the vast majority of which went to the West. Like the, if you look at the at the sort of balance of payments and in the, the U.S. political economy over time, the dams and the interstate highway system are really sort of like a natural outgrowth of the system that existed before that, which exists to pipe capital and people and resources from the East Coast, where the city is the biggest business and the financial centers are, to the lesser developed Western part. Um, as a way, not just like as a favor to the West or whatever, but because there was a very real social and economic value in sort of letting off steam, so to speak, from the East Coast to make sure that the cities don't get too crowded, the opportunities don't get too, don't get too wide up, right? So that, to, to give people space to grow and to expand. Uh, so that was really the idea that was prosecuted in a very deliberate, straightforward way uh, for 40 years by uh, Roosevelt and, and, the, and his sort of heirs point where the Bureau of Reclamation invented entirely new systems to like, a dam accounting systems, whereby you could build dams that made no sense in the middle of nowhere and say, well, but the dam is creating this much, uh, the dam is creating this much uh, power and it's distributing this much water, and so like we can use, we can use the dams essentially that do make sense and are really, really producing a lot of stuff to cover up for the dams that aren't producing a lot of stuff. It's like having a business, like imagine a business that is like a car dealership and making golf course at the same place. The car dealership is making all of the money. Nobody is playing any golf. But you can, if you were creative with your accounting, you could move the numbers around and say we have two moderately successful businesses here, right? So that, that's really sort of the way that the Bureau of Reclamation ran the arm development increasingly uh, into the 20th century, which is one of the reasons why they started getting in trouble. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so, that sort of, the Grand Coulee Dam is one of the most spectacular things. I don't know if you've ever been up to west or to eastern Washington. Not, you know, not easy to get up there. But, uh, this is the dam that won the Pacific War. The, um, the, uh, uh, airplane, like the airplanes that won the Pacific War were created using aluminum that was smelted with grain with electricity. The Manhattan Project, the centrifuges that ran those aluminum, the, the, the centrifuges that purify the uranium were run using Columbia River electricity, specifically the bond of the 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 entire West Coast war effort was premised on harnessing the hydroelectric power of the Columbia River. 
river that was so vast and so strong that for many years, for throughout the 19th century, it was just like, no, you can't you can do partial dams on this thing. You would never do a full, you would never ever do a full width dam of Columbia. Right? <laughs> we did some really amazing things without a whole lot of, of technology. I mean, I write about this in my book. It's really, the, it's really striking the number of ways that the number of times that the engineers on these dams were confronted with problems, whether it be the engineering of, of concrete that could withstand the size and bulk of the Hoover Dam, or uh, you know how to get extra, how to move turbines from Shasta Dam up to Grand Coulee to get to get an extra power, or get an extra power online by Grand Coulee. Uh, these engineering problems that literally nobody in the world had ever faced before, and they just sort of threw themselves at them and solved them in really like remarkable and genius ways. I try, I try to document in the book. Uh, things like um, running pipes through the, the throughout the entire uh, concrete of the Grand of, of the Hoover Dam. And the Hoover Dam was lattice with construction with, uh, with pipes, enough pipes to 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 build the bikes and move it back. And those pipes running through the concrete blocks were necessary to carry cold water to cool the concrete blocks, because concrete cooling, and concrete hardening is an endogenous, it, it lets off heat, right? It's a chemical reaction, it lets off heat. And it turns out that if you pour enough concrete to build a Hoover Dam, that concrete would never set. The heat generated by the concrete would keep it liquid for more than 100 years, is what they calculated. By which point, obviously, leaving <laughs> else, everything else aside, your dam is gonna be foam, right? Your dam is just gonna be like a melted mess by, you know, Filled with cracks and fissures, it won't hold anything. So the solution was to it was to run pipes through all of the concrete blocks before they went up, so that they could super cool. the running ice water through the pipes, so they could cool the concrete blocks in situ before they could move before they were moved into the dam structure. The question became then: How do you get a huge amount of ice water in the middle of the Burning Nevada Desert? <laughs> like you can't just pull the I mean the Colorado River is right. It. Um, so what they did was they just built the world's largest refrigeration plant on the banks of the Colorado River. <laughs> the largest refrigeration plant in the entire world. They just built it in the middle of the burning desert and ran it to get cold water. Uh, when they needed to set the pen, when they ran into the issue that the, the, the pen stops in the Hoover Dam were going to be so big that they couldn't move them on trains. Um, they just decided to build enormous foundries right there on the banks of the river, and we just we just cast it there. They just they they and and by the way, the dam finished two years ahead of schedule yeah. and under budget. <laughs> <laughs> they, they couldn't do it today. They couldn't. They really, really couldn't. And the, okay. and, the, and the question, and the difference is, as to like why that wouldn't be possible would fill like several other books. That would be another yeah. story. <laughs> super super complicated question. Um, so uh, that is sort of setting the stage for like the, where the the grand project of which the Folsom Dam is a part. So the Folsom Dam specifically is obviously set on the American River, our beautiful and wonderful American River, uh, named originally the River of Sorrows by uh, a Spaniard named Gabriel Braga. Um, he was really bummed out that his expedition hadn't worked out, and so he was named the River of Sorrows. And uh, it's a little grimmer than it really was, but uh, he, his, his party was chasing some indigenous people who had escaped the mission and were in fled into the Delta, so it's not like he didn't really want them to succeed. Uh, <laughs> uh, and anyway, so uh, after him, after he sort of charted it, uh, the explorer and pioneer Jedediah Smith, I'm sure many of you have heard of, uh, moved his fur trapping operations onto the American River on Rio de Janeiro. And uh, the proliferation of Americans on the river caused the local indigenous people who spoke uh, Spanish as, a, as like a, a, a common tongue between them, right? Uh, um, a diplomatic tongue, if you will. Um, they called it Rio de los Americanos because it was just lousy with Americans all the time. So, <laughs> and it still is. Um, and really helped with that. So it became really like, it got really integrated into American culture uh, during the Gold Rush, obviously. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you know about that. And during the Gold Rush, a man named uh, a man named uh, uh, Horatio Livermore came. I think it was Gates Livermore. I'm just going to 
Sunday was great. Yes, yes. Horatio Gates Livermore arrived in California in 1850. Um, he arrived, came, he came over Echo Pass. He stayed in what is now Fosterville for a time. While staying there, he wrote a letter to his daughter back home, explaining, telling her that this was that he was staying in a place called Hangtown, uh, and it was the worst place he'd ever been. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny finding that letter. Uh, yeah, he was not he seemed like a really a really grim and violent place at the time. Not nearly not nearly as nice as it is today. Um, so he struck it, he quickly struck it rich enough to sort of to to start his own businesses and to finagle himself a state senate seat, um, which were really just sort of for sale at that time. Um, so he he was he got lucky basically in the gold rush and he joined the first wave of California capitalists who were who were bringing in a lot of the, if you, if you read it, I recently read a, a book called Palo Alto, which if you're not like <coughs> much of a political deck, I actually read that book before, but like, uh, it does a really good job of explaining how, how worldwide, not just Eastern capital, but worldwide capital was involved in making the gold rush happen in terms of like the equipment that they had and the technology they developed. There was a huge amount of capital rushing into California from all over, the world trying to get gold. It wasn't just it. Obviously, there were a whole lot of prospectors striking out on their own, but there was a huge amount of investment coming in. Um, and and Mr. Livermore got himself wrapped up in that, and uh, enough that his son, the confusingly named Horatio Putnam Livermore, which is why I was checking out earlier, uh, Horatio Putnam Livermore, his son, uh, came up with a scheme to. Uh, develop a whole, develop an economic hub on the American River. He was really taken by the uh, hydroelectric dam that he'd been hearing about uh, who were popping up in East Coast. He said, we can do that here. Um, especially with we have all this capital right from, from our gold success. And so he bought a uh, bunch of land with the intent to start a mill operation uh, at Bolsa. And the idea was that he was going to build a little hydroelectric dam, not a full river dam the way we have now, but you know, a little, a little diversion dam um, that was going to generate hydroelectricity that would power the milk complex. And uh, this was a really cool idea, except that he found pretty quickly that he didn't have the capital to make it happen. There was going to be a whole lot of labor, a whole lot of specialized labor involved. Um, and so he went around looking for a solution. The solution, it turns out, was to make a deal with the state. Which he exchanged, I think it was, I want to make sure. All right, 250 acres of land for $15,000 worth of prison labor for the state. Essentially, he exchanged land on the banks of the river to the state to build a prison in exchange for labor from the prisoners who would one day be in that prison. Uh, and uh, $15,000 worth of labor was the initial deal. And a few years later, he sued the state, asking for a better deal. State Supreme Court ruled against the state uh, <laughs> and awarded him vastly more prison labor than he had originally been contracted for. Um, and as a result, uh, let's see, okay, that's the guy just want to make sure the numbers are correct here. Uh, 60,000, you know, in the end terms were 60,000 man days of labor annually for, for five years. Woo! Trying to condition the shit. And, and that, that man, that, that is, that is, that labor is digging up river stones, right? That is, that shoveling bunk. That is truly back breaking unit, like, really just destructive, hellish labor. Um, and that is what got the, the diversion in Alabama. Um, the, uh, the Bolton Powerhouse, which you can go, I'm sure, you have in there, you'll see, I'm super. Uh, the Folsom Powerhouse uh, was built not with unskilled labor, but with the most skilled labor that they could find. They found the Italian masons to come out and, and build, the, uh, build the powerhouse because Horatio Putnam Livermore rationalized that, like, well, that the Romans had had so many buildings last for so long, and therefore the Italians had to know what they were doing. Um, not the first person, I guess, to really, to, you know, for erroneously place the faith in Italian. <laughs> As an Italian, it's like, we're, we're not the same. <laughs> we can't do what they did. Uh, anyway, so uh, the machinery in the powerhouse is still, 
it's still sitting there. You can go check it out. It is beautiful stuff. I can't. I couldn't believe how cool it looks. These just massive magnets wrapped in wire. It is it incredible? It's, it's it's extremely unsophisticated and like raw, and it makes it lays bare like the reality. And just so unsophisticated. Like I don't know how much about electricity, but right? like I took that aside from like high school physics, but like. It lays bare for like what what these machines are. You know, a lot of electrics like what's going on on this laptop. A lot of us, like our modern like our modern machinery obscures what's going on in it. That is nothing obscured about that. Everything is just whirling around. Uh, that looks moving right now, but it's it's whirling around right in front of you. It's incredibly like cool and and, and, and physical to see. Another reason why I recommend checking out the powerhouse. Um, but this plant generated. Electricity. It was, it, was, it was the first of its kind on the West Coast. It generated electricity. Crucially, it moved. Uh, so, again, specifics. Uh, these things were made specifically, made to specification by General Electric and their plant is connected to New York. They were shipped 19,000 miles around uh, around Cape Horn or Cape. Cape Good folks, right? Yes. Or Cape Horn. Cape Horn. I can never get those right. Yeah. No, not a, not a sailor. Uh, but uh, it's shipped around the southern tip of South America, yeah, the yeah. Panama Canal is not in place yet, and uh, 19,000 miles because they couldn't, they were too big to go on the train. So uh, they they moved 19,000 miles to do that, they installed them, and they generated, they spun around at 300 revolutions per minute, generating 120 volts at 60 hertz. Exactly the kind of electricity that your devices pull out out of the wall today. And that's not, to be clear, that is not because of the Volsen Dam. The Volsen Dam is not, it's not the reason everybody in America does that, North America does that. But it is a reason. <laughs> it's one of the very early progenitors of electrical systems. One of the very, the very earliest electrical systems on the West Coast were in Sacramento because they had three megawatts of power 20 miles uphill. And they piped it down to Sacramento and, these, and they have the wires in the uh, powerhouse. They're, they're just these enormous, uninsulated beds of copper. <laughs> no insulation whatsoever. And uh, they're just incredible things. And, and that was enough to power streetcars in Sacramento. It powered arc lamps on the on the streets. I don't know if you know what an arc lamp is. It essentially creates light by jumping a spark between the two, two close little nodes. Incredibly loud, incredibly light. It's like it smells bad. Super loud. The, the lights really harsh. It's very cool. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. There's a reason why Edison won, you know. Um, but that really that put Sacramento on the map in terms of having access to electricity. Like almost no cities on the on the West Coast did at that time. So and it's, it's super wow. so they're so good. And these are all governed and kept together. The the big thing is how do you keep four machines with four different and stocks with water falling on them. How do you keep the machines all running at the same speed to keep the electricity coming out of regular thing? The answer is you kind of see it back here. That little wheel back there. That is called a uh, a Lombard water wheel governor. It uses water pressure. It essentially it tests what it, it senses water pressure and and it uses is it senses the water pressure in each of the things and, and it uses water pressure inside itself to keep the things moving at the same speed. So if one starts moving, if one of these wheels starts moving too quickly relative, if this starts moving faster than that, the water pressure on this side of the water governor builds up. And the water pressure on that side building up slows it down. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a regulating system that is entirely made of wheels and it belts. <laughs> and it works, I can't believe it works with it. Uh, and so, this is, uh, we're going to skip forward in time a little bit, right? So this, the, the, the original Folsom Dam went up in 1895. In, 1950, in, 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 the, in 1952, uh, 51 is when they technically started working on the Folsom Dam. Uh, they, this is the, the situation on the American River prior to the existence of the dam, right? So you see the forks of the river, this area, which would be Folsom Lake, and, and the red markings there are the outline that will eventually be the dam, right? Just going to give you this picture and then just close to that. <laughs> Go back. Credit to local historian Kevin Knauss, and these awesome photos I can take them. But that is the circumstance. And obviously, it's an absolutely incredible change in the landscape, total overall. In a, but in a way that would seem to someone like me, 
everybody born after this or anything came along after this. Like it had always been that way, right? Like you come along and you see a reservoir in the middle of this event before. You don't know what it looked like beforehand. The creation of the dam retroactively erases everybody's memory of what was underneath the dam. You know, in ways that are very interesting to think about. But this is, this was the setup. This was the huge amount of land that just vanished essentially forever uh, because of the creation of Wilson Lake. And it's a good thing they did that because before the dam had even been completed, the 1953 California floods came through historic rainfall. Um, California from 19, the 30s and 40s was insanely wet compared to today. Uh, and, and even before 1970, it was a totally different game. Like the, the, the weather that we had this winter, as wet as it seemed, as historically wet as it seemed, would have been basically an average winter prior to 1970. And it would have been, it would have been totally unremarkable in the 30s and 40s. Uh, there's just way less water in the atmosphere around here than it used to be. Or it gets distributed differently, right? Um, so it's just a huge change, huge change in the area. And full sun really sort of benefited from both waves of American damage. The very first pioneering wave, and then they got a revision in 1953, which doesn't usually happen. Uh, but it's such a good site, right? Like such a valuable site that, um, that they built it twice. Um, and so yeah, in 1953, huge floods come through the area, uh, and huge rains come through the area. And so before the dam even built, it, before, it built before it was even finished, rather, uh, it had prevented serious and major flooding of the Sacramento area, even before it was finished. So, uh, and goodness knows how many times it's been since. It's just the sort of thing. Like, it, there's some dams around here in, in the state of California that are you know, wanting to come down, and there's lots of discussions about the future of the dam and the rivers. Nobody has ever suggested that this flood control dam does not need to be in place. The, by the American River, essentially the Folsom Lake, Folsom Dam, Folsom Lake behind it, by sealing off that, that entire part of the American River below the port, is essentially, you have essentially 100 miles of Sierra draining into that, like a flood. So, that sort of puts into perspective like the sort of the flood risk, right? So the flood, the, the, the water that arises in the lake, water lies from a huge stretch of land, huge stretch of mountains. And that's why flood management becomes very, you know, that's why they were worried about flood level, about uh, dam levels in Oroville uh, and in Folsom and, and the other Sierra dams over this winter because every one of those dams is, is draining a huge swath of the mountains. So uh, yeah, these are a couple photos from like during the construction, right? I'm sorry if everything's crazy. Uh, but you can see here the river has been stopped, right? The river has been completely plugged in. It's, it's been diverted, and you can't see it's like that. It's where, it's where the river would actually be flowing. Uh, the river in that photo has been completely stopped up, and they're, they're, they're setting up the, the base underneath it. And obviously, this is farther back down the American River Canyon a bit, and you get a picture of the, the ruins of the old Folsom Dam. It's not a full river dam, it's sort of off on the side. It's a little diversion canal that ran along the top of the bridge and then dropped. Uh, so, what was the setup? This is a picture from 1995. If anybody was looking here, those for that round of flooding. Very famously, it's all sort of like the, the, the doors failed. It wasn't so much a historic flood, the failure of the doors. You can see the mangled doors at the top of the that one. So it was a, a failure of the dam system caused you know, a huge, a huge leak of water. And that's sort of an example of how dams actually fail. Like we, a dam failure very, very rarely looks like the dam exploding or having some sort of catastrophic failure, particularly in the 20th and 21st century. Uh, it looks more like this. It's like little, little, little leaks, little problems that if left untended risk, you can't leave that much water going over the front of the dam, obviously. It's going to carve out the so that is an example of the sort of thing, the sort of volumes of water that Folsom Dam holds back all the time. What we would be dealing with in terms of volume, you know, is the, the entire course of the American River through Sacramento would just not be developable in the absence of the Folsom Dam. It would just be massive. You'd have to have big floodplains devoted to, to protecting everything else in the of the city. Um, and yeah, so this is sort of an example. This is a picture of, of which the top co-owners, 
And there's, there's four dams on the Klamath River right now um, that are sort of slated to come down. And so this is, I have this picture just because I think it's, it's they're in the process of taking the dam down right there. You can see the water coming down over the front of it. Um, I bring, I have this picture here because this is an example for what the future looks like in terms of, of dam management. Um, not for Olson Dam, obviously. Uh, it's for really too valuable as a, as a flood stop to, to consider doing this. But the dams on the Klamath River are not, these are like, that's not a flood control dam. That's an irrigation dam. The purpose of this dam is to provide water to ranchers. And there aren't really farmers in that area so much, there's more ranchers than farmers. So, uh, and it becomes eventually a calculation that in an age of drought and what is this, what is the, the, the definite mega drought Right now we're at we're we're essentially in the worst mega drought in, in even this last in this last winter you can't take that into consideration. It's the worst drought in you know 1,200, 1,500 years. So the question becomes, how do you want to use your water? How do you want to use your resources during this time, uh, during such a, a time of squeeze? So the decision that was made for the climate river dams that taking them down, letting the rivers flow free, flow free, and supporting the salmon populations, which were super duper endangered. Uh, was a better use of the water than uh, than diverting that water to uh, to ranchers, and that's you know a calculation. The state makes sense the state calculation that local locales make. There's recently a federal court decision on a, on siding against the, the the ranchers and supporting breaking down the dam. So uh, the future is in our state. You know it is is drought. And the interesting thing about drought, especially mega drought, is that water is overall scarcer, but it becomes concentrated in, 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 in different places that you might not expect. So water overall is less scarce. There's less storms on the whole, but the storms you do get are fiercer, and they're more damaging, and it puts more pressure on your infrastructure. So the question for us going forward is, what do we want our infrastructure to look like? How do we want to manage it? And uh, what, what do we want to choose for the future of the dams that protect our communities, or maybe in some communities, you know, it, it's better to take them down. So uh, that's our little part of this giant project, uh, the Olson Dam, part of American Flood Control. And uh, thank you very much for listening to uh, to my little presentation. If you guys would like to uh, to pick up the book, or get, get a bunch of stories about American water, uh, the chapters about there's a chapter about uh, Glen Canyon, there's a chapter about East Coast flooding, there's a chapter about Hurricane Katrina. Uh, there is a whole bunch of stuff in there, and uh, I encourage you to pick it up if you're interested in American uh, infrastructure and, and water and that sort of thing. So uh, thank you very much, guys. Thanks for having me. So everybody. <laughs>